All right, Michelle, I think you can go ahead and get started. Thank you so much, Liz. I really appreciate it. So my job at the top of every webinar that you see from Disability Without Poverty is to go over the accessibility. So welcome, everybody. Um, today's webinar is called Disability with Possibility, what we learned from, the dis from disabled people across Canada on shaping the Canada Disability Benefit. My name is Michelle Hewitt. I'm the Chair of Disability Without Poverty, and along with Rabia Hader, our National Director, we will be your hosts for today's event. So before we begin with the webinar, I'm going to go over our accessibility components and the agenda for today. We fully acknowledge that the Zoom platform isn't fully accessible to every disabled person. We do our very best to build in the accommodation features that are available to us, like ASL, LSQ and French language interpretation. The chat has been disabled to accommodate presenters and people with vision loss, which is very distracting to us. If you have any concerns, please send an email to us at hello at disabilitywithoutpoverty.ca. If you are experiencing technical difficulties, you will be able to send a chat message to the hosts and panelists. For all questions you have, please put these in the Q&A box, usually at the bottom of your screen. We'd greatly encourage you to share your questions as we'll try to respond to as many as we can today. Our meeting today features simultaneous English and French translation, LSQ and ASL interpretation, English and French captioning. Please take a moment to adjust your settings as appropriate. First, please select your preferred language, English or French. You do this by selecting the interpretation option on your Zoom menu. Once you select this option, you will not need to change language settings again during the presentation. You must select a language, even if you want to hear this presentation in English. If you are using a mobile device, such as a phone or a tablet, you can find language interpretation options under more. For those who require ASL or LSQ interpretation, we will be spotlighting those components throughout the presentation. No need to do anything as these will automatically remain on your screen. To enable captions, select the captions option on your Zoom menu. If you would like to adjust the size and placement of these captions, you will need to go into your Zoom accessibility settings. For those of you who would like to access French captions for the event today, please click on the link that has been put into the webinar chat box to access these online. If we can support you through this presentation, please send us a message in the chat box and someone will assist you. For any additional settings, please go to your personal Zoom account settings or your in-webinar audio settings for more customization. So, to summarize our accessibility options, please select your language using the interpretation option, enable captions if required, and finally, make sure to share your questions in the Q&A box. Our team members are on hand to help you with any technical difficulties you may be experiencing. We've done this a fair few times now, and I have to say that the team that we work with, based out of Plan Institute, they are excellent at supporting you and supporting us through this. And we thank them for all of the hard work that they do, along with our interpreters today, because without them, we couldn't make this webinar happen. So now I'm going to pass over to Rabia, who is going to go through the, the land acknowledgement and some more and things just changed a little bit on my screen, sorry. And she, Rabia is going to go through the land acknowledgement and um, our introductions. 
Okay, well, thank you very much, Michelle. I am talking to you today from the traditional territories of the Mississaugas of the New Credit, most recently situated here in Mississauga, Ontario. First and foremost, um, our utmost gratitude to our First Peoples, our First Peoples of Turtle Island, our, our uh, First Nations, Indigenous, Métis, uh, ancestors for preserving and protecting Turtle Island. As settlers, we have occupied these lands and benefited from their abundance. We are committed to truth and reconciliation and disability justice for all First Peoples from sea to sea to sea and globally living with disabilities. Disability Without Poverty, I am its national director, as Michelle mentioned, and she is the chair. We are a movement that emerged after the throne speech of 2020 of the Canada Disability Benefit, which we have seen make its way into law, and we are awaiting the budget tomorrow, where we are assured to hear an amount. So a lot of things are happening today, Michelle. We scheduled this webinar anticipating that the budget would have been tabled in March and we would be talking about our disability with possibility findings through the Shape the CDB and would be talking about what the budget means in terms of disability poverty. However, today we are anticipating a budget. We have an Angus Reid poll with overwhelming support for the CDB that is also uh, out there that we were involved with commissioning. And we are sharing our Shape the CDB findings where we consulted all of you across this country. And we will talk about who we talked to and what we heard today. You know, Rabia, it, it does just seem so bizarre that uh, that here we are and uh, we really expected to be doing the reverse. And now it's, you know, why are we talking about our, our results the day before the budget? But it's just the way things happen, as, as we found out all along in this process. So we have Shape the CDB to talk about and we have our Angus Reid poll results and how we can kind of blend those together and what it's, it's, taught, what it's taught us. This morning, um, I, I have a service dog called Leo, who is the love of my life. And we go out walking and I have a playlist of, uh, of dog walking songs that I listen to. And the last one that came up before I came home was Tracy Chapman talking about a revolution. And the line in the song is, Talking about a revolution sounds like a whisper. And I heard myself say out loud, no, no, it doesn't. Right now, I think in the disability community, talking about this revolution sounds like a roar. It's an absolute roar of people together. So what are we going to do today? We're going to talk about what the shade, what is the shape, the CDB? Who did we reach? Our key findings. And then we will do some uh, Q&A and see where we go from there. So let's start and Rabia, you and I, can, uh, we're just going to kind of bounce this back and two between us. And let's talk about um, some general statistics, first of all. So I'm going to talk about what's kind of on the screen and Rabia's, uh, Rabia's going to pick up with, with some more reflections from there. 16% of, uh, of disabled people live in poverty. We think that's more than 1.5 million people, as best we can do. One of the most recent piece of information that, we, uh, that we've received is that in 2022, we now have 27% of the population are disabled. So that's approximately 8 million people. We are a large minority. And 41% of the people who live in poverty are disabled. Then I can proudly say that the last statistic on this slide is that is from our previous Angus Reid poll that said that 89% of Canadians said that disabled people should not live in poverty. Let me tell you that that number has now changed. Rabia, 
You want to give the news of our Angus Reid poll? Drum roll. <laughs> Lots has changed. In fact, there's more support to end disability poverty and budget this benefit at an adequate amount. So eight, from 89% in 2021, today, Canadians of all political stripes wrapped up into an average of 91% support ending disability poverty and, and the Canada, through the Canada Disability Benefit. So this is significant, this is huge. This speaks truth to power, the power of the 20%, 27%. We, hashtag, we are the 27%. And the 27% of us are loved, cared for, befriended, neighbors to, friends of, supporters of the 73 other percent. And most Canadians with and without disabilities, 91% in fact, whether liberal, conservative, NDP, Bloc Québécois, of whichever political color or stripe that they voted for in the last election say, that we need the Canada Disability Benefit to end disability poverty, that people with disabilities deserve better. This just speaks volumes to our to our Canadian values, Michelle. Absolutely. And, um, you know, Rabia and anybody at DWP knows that I was extremely nervous going into this poll because we've been through hard times since we did the last one. Inflation has been rampant and people are struggling out there. And to know that through that, we still, as Rabia said, that other 74% of people who are not disabled, they've come through and said, yeah, we still believe that our fellow Canadians should be lifted out of poverty or our fellow people that live here in Canada, whether that's, um, whether that's people who are permanent residents or recently arrived or whoever you may be that lives here, that 91% um, of Canadians are with you. And another, and I think that um, that backs up what we found in our Shape the CDB report. I think one of the important things to know is that I don't think we're going to tell you anything today that you're going to say, well, I kind of already knew that. But that's really important in itself. It's important. You know, this isn't typically what happens when you ask people their opinions. Often you get divergent opinions. What we're finding is that when you talk to disabled people, their friends and families and allies, and when you talk to the general Canadian population, you get the same results. So let's move on a little bit and talk about what we actually did. So the Shape the CDB has got three phases to it. The first phase was an online survey, and I hope many of you took part. We had... Um, 4,537 responses and a 90% in completion rate, which is incredibly high. Out of that, 90% of people were disabled and 10% were friends, carers, family members, allies. There's one statistic, though, that has blown me away, and I, I keep coming back to it. Of the people who identified as disabled, 32% of them said that they were also the carer or caregiver of somebody who was disabled, whether that's a child or an adult. And, you know, I, I keep saying I find that amazing. But, you know, Rabia, um, I'm the carer of somebody that's disabled and so are you, right? So any thoughts on... on um, uh, who took part in phase one, and then we can chat about phase two. Well, again, um, you know, that overwhelming response of disabled people plus people with disabilities who also provide care to people with disabilities in their lives, whether it's their parent, child, spouse, sibling. I'm the substitute decision maker for my brother, and I make a lot of his financial and health decisions. I don't necessarily provide physical care, and I am a person with a disability. I'm blind. 
Um, you know, what, what's also very interesting is 62% of people who responded reported income below $24,000. So in fact, they were people, they are, they were, majority of respondents in our questionnaire were people with disabilities experiencing poverty. So we really heard from people who are impacted. We also, you know, what was, what was fascinating is we also heard from all those target groups, identity groups, who government says they're hard to reach. Now, majority of our respondents were women. And that's, you know, again, not much surprise. Often carers are women. We had good geographic representation, but in terms of equity um, demanding or equity seeking representation, 18% were LGBTQ+, 15% were racialized people like me, 7% were transgender, non-binary or other, 6% were indigenous, which is close to the national average, 4% were newcomers, refugees, immigrants, 4% were previously incarcerated. In other words, they, they experienced being imprisoned. 1% live in institutions. Now, government in its Disability Inclusion Action Plan consultations identified, as Michelle loves to say on page 32, that these were the hard to reach groups. We, as a grassroots movement, definitely proved our value in tapping into people who aren't often heard from because we truly embrace nothing about us without us, Michelle. Absolutely. So then when we moved on to our phase two, which was the peer-to-peer -peer conversations, and that was only disabled people put, took part, disabled people talking to disabled people, we really made sure that the page 32, as Rabia says, was something that um, that was highly important to us. And we had over, um, we had roughly 300 people take part and 54% reported having an income below $20,000. And in this group, even more were carers, 38% were carers. And in this group, we had a higher indigenous representation 10% were Indigenous compared to 5% of all people over Canada. I, uh, I'm really excited that, that we were able to, to reach out to people. I, took, I was a peer-to-peer -peer interviewer. Um, my, my research is with people, younger disabled adults who <coughs> live in long-term care facilities. And I, I, I very much appreciate the time that the people took to talk to me and you know found it um i found i found it very emotional for us to talk about these situations that that people find themselves in through through their disability and that the poverty that they live in even though people presume a roof over their head and meals during the day it kind of presumes that that they, they, they can't possibly be living in poverty but the situations are really tough there so i'm i'm you know i i found that uh, the whole experience to be something that was very affirming to the things that we've been talking about so perhaps rabia i'm looking at the time we should move on to looking at some key findings so we have seven key findings urgency dignity additional uh, added costs inclusive eligibility simple applications, a fair benefit, and keeping people with disabilities involved. So should we move on to the first one, Rabia? Urgency. Absolutely. Well, again, 62% of, of respondents are struggling to get by. 25% um, are okay, can afford the basics. You know, people told us having this benefit would help them keep a roof over their heads. So they're at risk of homelessness. 
you know, uh, one of our participants had multiple disabilities and lives with, you know, uh, like a disability from birth with mental health issues on top of that. You know, 40% uh, yeah, of that's people a... live in dire poverty. So people yeah. have really exacerbated um, disability related barriers due to no fault of their own. And on top of that, the poverty experience com exacerbates their their health and well-being. And certainly, you know, we're feeling the urgency because, you know, that very brief summary of where we're at, it became legislation last summer in June. And if if nothing happens before then, what's called being brought into force is triggered on June the 22nd. And then there is potentially another whole year for the recommendations to be written. But it doesn't have to take that long. Right. It, it, it just doesn't have to be like that. It can be different. And that raw that I was talking about that is currently focused on tomorrow and the budget. I think that that um, that raw now needs to be after the budget focused on this urgency, because, um, you know, I, I, I find that for three winters now, I've said, this has to be the last winter that people live like this yeah. and, and, and still it rolls on. So and, and we've uh, always so, said, Michelle, Michelle, we've always said that poverty does not wait. Poverty no. is getting worse and worse for people. Yeah. And they just can't, you know, be waiting for something to come. And now we're anticipating that something is coming. We just don't know what. So that takes us on to the next point, Rabia, which is dignity. Do you want to lead with that or do you want me well, to? Well, this benefit, this benefit must work well for everybody. No matter where they live, with whom they live, how much their money spouse or family has, and whether or not they have a job or whatever benefits they have. This benefit is intended, people want to see it harmonized so there's no negative consequences on their lives and they want to be treated as an individual. So, so they understand that it may be income tested, but they do not want it quote unquote means tested, which, is, which has been often used as a, as a way to keep people in poverty because the system looks at, oh, well, you know, your, your parents make this much or you live in a household with income. If the individual themselves don't have income for themselves, they are at risk. They are in poverty and they don't have the dignity that they want. So in order to have the dignity, they need that income that looks at their individual circumstance as an adult. And 94% of people who responded in phase one said that it must be an individualized benefit. And those of us who have experience of benefits, typically, you know, CPPD is individualized. Um, but any benefits that we get from provinces, they tend to be means tested. We need this to, to, to stay in that individualized column, right? We need it to stay so that it's, it's not, so that it gives the dignity. It means safety to people, right? It, it means that, you know, again, typically, not always women facing abusive relationships, that if you don't have money of your own, you, you, you can't leave. You feel trapped, right? So you feel trapped in the cycle of violence and poverty. So, but it, the other thing is we've often called this the right to love, you know, that people, if they, if it's, if things are um, means tested rather than individualized, it often means that people lose access to other supports, it might be care hours or other benefits they get, or the, you know, that the, the amount that they get as a disabled couple isn't enough for them to be able to live on because it's been reduced so significantly. So it's, you know, again, this is something we've talked about before, but very clearly. And, and what Shape the CDB has allowed us to do is to say, rather than 
us talking, saying, you know, this is what we think. Whenever we're meeting with, Rabbi and I are meeting with government officials, now we're, we're saying we have the evidence, we have the absolute evidence in, in that this is what 4,500 people told us, which if, uh, putting my math teacher head on, if, uh, you know, is a, an extremely representative sample of the number of disabled people in Canada. So the next one is a big issue for us all. It's added costs. Um, and, you know, it says in the legislation that the amount of the benefit needs to consider the additional costs of disability. And certainly the results that we got told us clearly that, that, that's, that that's what needs to happen. I think one of the things that I found was uh, we, we had a writing column um, because we'd had a number of questions that was like, yes, no, maybes. Um, do you think it should be prescription drugs should be in that additional cost? Do you think this, that and the other? And it became really clear that in the writing column that what we'd missed in our list of, you know, yes, no's was transportation. And many people wrote to us about why, why transportation is such a critical issue for them, whether it's the ability to simply access buying groceries, medical appointments, um, accessing you know, family so that they're not isolated, all those kinds of things. Rabia? We... You know, the, the, the added costs are, are a reality for each one of us in, in many different ways. And the CDB, this is why we're working hard, given the um, added costs, given uh, the fact that people want dignity. We're working hard province by province, Michelle, and we've been in BC and we're working in Alberta and in Ontario and, and, and hoping that this benefit, once announced and implemented, is harmonized so there are no negative consequences to people, that truly their dignity is in, intact and their added costs are considered. One of the um, really encouraging statistics out of the Angus Reid poll, 58% of people, and it was again co covered a, pretty much the same, um, didn't matter who people voted for previously, you know, wh where their politics leaned. 58% of people believed that the benefit should be above the, the poverty line. 31% believed it should be at the poverty line, giving us 89% of people, again, that same 80, 90%, taking us to, um, to be at or above the poverty line. And I think, you know, I think, again, it's that knowing that we have that support, not just from those of us within the disability community that, uh, that understands these issues, but to know that Canadians at large agree with that. And that's a powerful message for us to give. It's that roar again, right, to give to, to politicians that, uh, that why this needs to be. Yeah, no, Rabia, yeah. Any, anything I missed? No, I, I'm good. I was going to move on to inclusive eligibility that, in fact, super. you know, most respondents want the Canada Disability Benefit to be easy to apply for and to receive. They want to ensure that it's actually accessible regardless, regardless of, of how their disability presents itself or what kind of disability they have or who they are or, or where they are within the country. 96% want a dedicated pathway, for example, for Indigenous peoples. So 97% say it needs to reach the most people possible who need it. So, yeah, so there's an advert I keep seeing on um, at the moment for the Tangerine Bank. And it's all about hoops. And I keep thinking that um, it should be our advert because it's, you know, the, the, the premise of it is people applying, I guess, to some banks 
come across a lot of hoops and keep walking into them and and then all of a sudden the people with ta- uh, you know tangerine bank don't have to go through the hoops anymore um that's us right how many hoops have we all been through of any shape size length you name it um and yeah disabled canadians told us strongly and it was something that we've advocated for since day one that if you're already receiving a federal territorial or provincial benefit you should get immediate access to the cdb no more hoops let's um let's just keep on going okay so any more on that part i see that we've just lost our um screen sharing perhaps that we've we lost our our powerpoint perhaps it's going to come back to us in a moment no i'm good on I'll that wait. Yeah, you're good on that. There you go. (laughs) Okay, the next one is simple application. Um, Yeah, and simple application covers off a little bit of that. You know, if they're already in a provincial program, that they should be automatically enrolled into a federal program, which is which is huge. People want it to be easy and accessible and and. You know, again, Michelle, like you said, all the hoops, right? People don't want to be jumping through those hoops. Yeah, and I I think one of the things that we've heard from the start is that one of the things that the government may use as their entry point is the disability tax credit. And and we know that that's, that's not the friend to many disabled people, but take up is only at 40% of where it should be. And that's because it is not a simplified application process. It's an expensive, cumbersome process where people get rejected and don't really know why. So, you know, I think that um, there's there's a couple of ways to look at this is that put these two points together. First of all, no more hoops if you've already passed a significant hoop straight on in. But if you're going to make that hoop the disability tax credit, it really needs to be the easiest easiest hoop the widest one that's the easiest to pass through and certainly not what it is at the moment so the next one rabia oh sorry go on yes go ahead i'm just gonna say again people told us you know like the the endless possibilities that would be available to them like for example a well organized and funded cdb would would change their lives it would allow them to get out of the house more be involved more in the community contribute in various ways that they can't right now due to the financial barriers that they face. I think for me, and why we ultimately as a group decided to call this as disability with possibility, one of the wonderful things about hearing from people the way we did is rather than coming out of this with a list of woes, we came out of it with a list, we came out of it with a sense of possibility. And, you know, I know the people that I interviewed when I said to them, so, you know, what would happen if you uh, if if this lifted you above the poverty line? There was this sort of sigh and smile and like, oh, relief of, oh, and the things that they came up with weren't certainly, as we all know, weren't you know flying off to Hawaii or something. They were, you know, that medication that I take that I can't afford. And because I don't take it, I end up in this loop of going back into hospital and you know, so I think that I think, as you say, that possibility, it, it it really can't be understated that that's so. And, you know, to think that once this starts to roll out and once, we, you know, we, this happens, that we end up with all of this possibility with and that people start to see disabled people being able to, to use words that we, we saw over and over again that they would be able to thrive rather than survive. So the next one kind of goes into this. It's a fair benefit. Do you want to talk about it a bit or do you want me to, what do you want to do? Well, people want a fair benefit. They want a benefit that is enough to lift them out of poverty. That there was overwhelming support for that. And that also is mirrored in our uh angus reed poll that you know 97 percent of people in our shape the cdb consultation are saying that it should be well funded to lift people with disabilities out of poverty 
91% of Canadians spoke that similar truth that they want the Canada disability benefit. They support it. So somebody, Rabia, told me that the request that we are making is outrageously reasonable. And I thought, yeah, that's really true. How, you know, just to ask for people to be at or above the poverty line. And I know Rebecca out there is waiting to hear me say this because the poverty line itself ain't no lollipops and rainbows, right? It's like just getting people to the poverty line. And we know that at the moment that um, from our friends at Maytree, there's only one province, um, Newfoundland, where people are not people um, on disability welfare payments across the country are not living below what's called the deep poverty line, right? And that's so that's the size of the situation. It's it's not that you know people are close to the poverty line. That I think that off the top of my head, I think the deep poverty line is two thirds of of the actual poverty line. But it's you know it's called the deep poverty line, right, for a reason. And so, you know, it, again, outrageously reasonable, a fair benefit, right? That's what we're asking yeah. for. And what's interesting here, Michelle, is people are also saying, 90% of people are saying that the Canada Disability Benefit should advance the goals of the Accessible Canada Act by 2040. That, you know, we have broad-based legislation wanting to ensure an inclusive and accessible Canada and that the CDB is the path forward to realizing that dream of an accessible Canada. Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard, like, as we do this, Rabia, I, I, it's a roller coaster. And at the moment, I, I, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited about this possibility, right, of, uh, of advancing, you know, the, the Accessible Canada Act. And here in BC, we have the ABC, Accessible BC, of course. I, I, I really, you know, I, I, I see the difference that it's making in places as the conversations that we're having. I'm, I'm on a committee in my own city and we have very tough conversations with members of the, of, of the city council and so on. And those conversations weren't happening 10 years ago. So it's, you know, when we put all of these pieces together, allowing disabled people to actually thrive and we put it together with these other pieces of legislation, it's, uh, it's exciting if we get there because point seven is keep disabled people involved. Nothing about us without us. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, 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 don't, um, I don't know how it could possibly happen without disabled people being involved because nobody understands it like we do um, and we know that whether it's something that's physically built in our community or if it's a program that that's built for us um, you know I, I I just think that it can't be done it or it will it would just be a the type of processes that would be designed would miss some of the most obvious things a few years ago in, in, in my city, to apply for the, a job here, um, on the, you had to go through a website, which we know are not necessarily already always screen reader friendly. But the first thing that you had to do was put your driver's license number in to sort of, you know, prove that you were a real person or something. Well, think about it. How many disabled people that could do many jobs at the city don't have a driver's license number and it's that kind of thing that that people if you're not disabled you just don't think it through but we deserve to be involved right rabia nothing about us without us yep absolutely and that brings us forward to where we are now so we have our shape the cdb we have heard from people of all the possibilities of how they could improve their own quality of life with a top-up benefit. This top-up benefit would maybe allow Kate to live on her own 
like any other able-bodied person rather than living for a lifetime with family. It would allow somebody to volunteer, to maybe even consider applying for jobs and going out and trying for job interviews because it even costs money to attempt that. If you don't have money, how do you make money, right? So when you have your basic needs met, then you can consider getting out of the house, having clothes to wear, having transportation, feeling good, looking good to go and get a job maybe and work some of the hours that you're able to work if you are able to work. No disabled person wants to sit at home and do nothing. Everybody has a need to contribute, a need to be productive, a need to participate and, and look at the potential of what they can achieve. And we heard that throughout from the people that responded to shape the CDB, that this benefit would give them endless possibilities. So this benefit is not a cost. It's not an expense on a budget line. It's an investment in the future of Canadians with disabilities living in poverty today. We have benefits for children, the Canada Child Benefit. We have income supplements for seniors through the Guaranteed Income Supplement. We have nothing for adults with disabilities living in poverty. The Canada Disability Benefit is law. It's on the verge of being budgeted, and there's a lot of work ahead to truly address disability poverty. So in this conversation that we had through this questionnaire and through our peer-to-peer -peer discussions, our next step was to form the Disability Poverty Action Group, the DWP Action Group that we are hosting through a platform known as Community Labs. And we have a couple of hundred people actively engaging, and we will be creating more opportunities for more participation there. But it's because it's truly nothing about us without us. And Michelle and I do not voice for all of us. We need every one of us voicing for ourselves and expressing our views. And Michelle and I are doing our best to carry those forward where we can, but we need everyone else working with us along the way. Absolutely. And Rabia, while you've been talking, I've been trying to skim the, the questions um, that, that have uh, been put to us. Um, a lot of the questions are asking us about, you know, is it going to be, um, um, is my situation going to be included? Um, is when are the checks going to start flowing? Those kinds of things. So, you know, this is this is a long process, and it's not our process. And our role in this is, and all of us, and by our, I mean all of us, you included. Our role is to tell the government through our elected officials, or you can write to the prime minister himself to tell them that, that we cannot wait any longer. So, um, so just to say, all of the questions to do with, are there gonna be clawbacks? Will somebody with on this bin of benefit um, get the money? Will somebody with this type of disability get the money? We don't have the answers to those, but hopefully they're coming much sooner than you know, the last time we said we don't have the answers. Once, as I say, the latest that that process can possibly start is June the 22nd, because that's set by law and that that process has to be finished another year from then. And I know that's an awfully long time. I know that that's not what um, people want to hear. And that's not what we want to have happen at Disability Without Poverty either. So we are putting pressure on and we invite you all to do this. Um, we invite you to take part and to, for you to write out as well, to write as well. Rabia, um, 
do you want, just want to talk a bit more about ways that we ask people to be involved in the different things that we do? Well, again, sign up for our newsletter. If you have a story to tell, write it to us. We will find ways to share it, whether through a blog or an op-ed in the future. Uh, connect with us to connect with your local elected officials. We must continue to advocate. We must continue to dialogue. If we are seeing something budgeted tomorrow, it doesn't mean that it's the end of our job. We have a lot more work to do going ahead. And we can only do that work together as a movement of disabled people, families, and allies. If you are located in a minister's office, drop us a note, let us know that. Share your story, follow us on our social media. Let us know if you wanna join our community lab and be more actively engaged in our online community. We need everybody on board in a movement deep rooted in grassroots communities if we are to create a better tomorrow for disabled people in Canada. So it's where do we go from here? Nothing about us without us, Michelle. And I'm going to leave the questions to you because yeah. I kind of need to run out for that other situation. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, we have we have a lot going on as ever, and um, I'm just going to say to you farewell and uh, good, safe travels, Rabia. Um, so tomorrow is Budget Day. Our hope is that we're going to see money in the budget that will give us an, a sense of how the government intends to fund this. It may just like it may say something about an amount. It may say it may not say anything, but there really are hopes, and all of our pressure is that we're going to learn something. Whatever we learn tomorrow, then spurs us on the next day to new action. We begin to think, okay, what did we learn, and what can we do with that, and how do we need to tell them what's going to happen with that. So Rabia and I are actually going to be in Ottawa tomorrow um, and we intend to be telling people clearly our message as soon as we hear the budget, what, what, that in, that's, what, it intends, what we intend to do about it, and what we think, sorry, the government should be doing about it. Because um, as Rabia said, it's very important that we all work on this together. We have had a campaign over the last year of um, budget the benefit we do know that that along with you know we have worked with great partners the daily bed the sorry the daily bread food bank of toronto they sponsored the um the the canada Dis um, sorry i'm losing my words now as we're getting towards the end of the hour they sponsored um the Angus Reid poll along with us, along with Angus Reid that, that we talked about this repeat one. And so we are so grateful to them. We are members of a network, National Disability Network, and we have been meeting so closely with members of other disability organisations. And we have been working out, I hope you've seen on social media, I hope you've seen um, campaigns that we've worked on together and that, that, that we are ready to, to launch um on whatever we hear tomorrow we have um we and and from we have also got so many partnerships going on in our communities um from amanda and kat in bc who are doing such great work and i'm going to forget names and so i apologize from jan and um the david and don in alberta and Janet and Lisa in Ontario and Amy who's working hard in Quebec. We have people working on the ground, talking to people so that it's not just if you belong to a large organization, 
that your voice is heard, that that grassroots message that is so important to us is is kept going as as we move forward. Um, I'm 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 trying to um, you know people. I see we're going to be we'll be sending an email to subscribers tomorrow, outlining your interpretations and the implications of the the benefit. Um, yes, we're very much going to try to do that. Um, I see things coming in on the chat and the Q&A, and I'm just going to say, Liz, if you can capture the people who are asking, if it's possible, I don't know if it is, the people who are asking to be part of our community um, labs group. Um, I, I'm feeling that, um, that, that I'm starting to, that, as I say, Rabia has had to leave. Uh, oh, sorry, somebody is asking me if there's a question I can answer relatively easy it's not what is the exact figure the poverty line in canada it's not an easy answer there are there are over 50 poverty lines in canada so what happens is they have something called the market basket measure and they work out that for example um you know i live in bc the poverty line in vancouver is very different to a rural community and so that's why there are so many across the country so when we talk about lifting people above above the poverty line, that's not even an easy thing to measure, right? So, um, you know, because what lifting somebody across the poverty line in Vancouver is compared to somebody in Red Deer, compared to somebody in Brampton, compared to somebody in Calumet, they're all different. But we know there's there's we tend to go with the larger cities because they have the um, they have the um, the highest poverty lines, right? So, because obviously, typically things like housing push that poverty line so much higher. So I I want to say to you all that, you know, I started off by saying that this is a revolution. This is a change that we're looking for, for disabled people across Canada that, uh, you know, it wasn't until September 2020 that we even thought that this was, was possible at all because when the government announced that they were prepared to do it, even though many disability organisations and disabled people had been asking for it for many years. It's one of those landmark moments in Canadian history um, that, you know, at, at some point there was no... EI, there was no welfare, there was no pension plans, right? Every time one of those things happened, it was a, it was a monumental change. And this is it. This is one of those things. And we have made that happen. And when I say we, I don't mean me. I mean all of you through our, our, uh, our continued participation. So... Um, Oh, I see a question about the next election election. And yeah, that's, you know, if, and, and I see, Simon, that you say that the party that may get in is skeptical of investing in communities. All I can say is our Angus Reid poll showed that voters from all parties were right up there to make that 91 percent that support it were right up there like um you know, in the high 80s, and some of them were over to make that average of 91%. So this revolution has caught on to people of all parties, and it, the roar needs to continue. So I think that, you know, I, be, I believe that our elected officials, they are elected by us, and it's our job to tell them what it is that we expect them to do. So if the supporters of all the parties are saying that they believe that this should be funded and continue to happen, that's what those parties should do. So I, I fully believe that that's what we need to do to get this funded benefit into everybody's pockets as soon as possible. I am going to say thank you to everybody that's been here. Over 200 people have stayed the course and I know, I'm sorry, my energy is very much flagging at the moment as uh, I, I can tell you my personal thing is I'm preparing to fly for the first time with my service dog to, to, to do two things. One is the government has invited me 
to a, a witness to be a witness to a committee so they're they're they're, they're getting me there um, because i wouldn't usually fly um a, a committee that is interested in what happens when you fly when you're disabled so you know my power wheelchair my service dog and i are getting on a plane like later today so i'm slightly distracted by being extremely anxious about that but that's my world and my day so i will thank you all for the over 200 people who have stayed with us through this i i thank all of you who have taken part in any of our campaigns in any way that read our newsletters that send in your thoughtful comments to us we do read them we do try and act on them even though sometimes it might not seem that way i'm very grateful to all of our staff and the extremely hard work that they they put in at um, all hours of the day because we are spread across the country across all time zones and so to stay in touch with each other and to react that's what's happening people work incredible hours and for us and i'm extremely grateful to them and as i say these people who have interpreted um, what i've been saying whether it's in asl lsq or my english to french and Rabia's English to French. I am extremely grateful to you and to the people at Plan Institute for the very hard work that you put into making these uh, these as seamless as possible. We will make the deck available for in English as well. We will make this um, this Facebook Facebook try again, Michelle. This these PowerPoint point slides available to everybody, and at some point the recording of this webinar. Um, will appear on our YouTube channel, though these last five minutes of me talking on my own are certainly not my proudest moment. So anyway, let's say good luck to us all for tomorrow. Um, I hope that we are all going to be feeling that we are a step closer to a funded benefit that will lift all disabled people in Canada out of poverty. Thank you very much and goodbye to you all.